I am happy to be joined with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal for another news roundup with the Somerville Journal. How are you doing, Julia? I'm good, Dave. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot to update as usual uh, with our with our biweekly updates. Um, and I know we like to start off with uh, how the COVID numbers are mm -hmm. uh, in Somerville. So can you uh, can you kick us off with with that update? Absolutely. So the city is graciously updating these numbers every day. Um, so the latest update I can report at the moment, um, the case numbers in Somerville as of May 26th um, in the morning, uh, there, there have been 864 residents who have tested positive. So we're starting to near 1,000. Um, 628 have recovered, and sadly, there have been 25 confirmed fatalities. Um, at this time, the city is not releasing details um, on those residents to the public, um, though it is public record if anyone is curious. Um, and as far as testing numbers, CHA has a testing site at Somerville Hospital, and the city is partnering with CHA as well as Cataldo Ambulance to bring a mobile testing unit, so like a fun little testing van um, out to residents who may be quarantining, may be isolating um, and can't necessarily, or just can't you know, get to the testing site at Somerville Hospital, um, which isn't necessarily accessible to every Somerville resident. Um, so, so far, as of Friday, May 22nd, um, they have tested 5,675 people at the Somerville site, but those some of those are CHA patients, not necessarily Somerville residents. So there have been 2,917 residents tested at CHA's site. Um, so and those numbers have been increasing because because of the launch of the mobile testing unit, um, as well as the expansion of testing to people who are not just CHA patients. Um, so though that's a good thing. That is also um, why you need to kind of make sure you're thinking about how the case numbers may be going up, which doesn't necessarily reflect that the virus is suddenly spreading faster um, because there is just more widespread testing. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with case numbers, testing numbers um, in the city, um, but definitely keep an ear out. Um, all residents are encouraged to get tested. Um, CHA's position is that, you know, if you feel like you may have been exposed, you should definitely get tested. If you feel like you've really limited your exposure, it's definitely not necessary for you to get tested. Um, but because the city has been instituting um, a contact tracing plan to try to figure out how this virus is moving in our community, they're encouraging residents, regardless of whether or not they're showing symptoms, especially if you feel like you may have been exposed. But even if you don't necessarily feel that way, to call, make an appointment, and get tested. Um, so while you can walk up, bike up, drive up, you do have to call. We have a number of stories out on this. If you go to the CHA website, if you go to the SomervilleMA.gov website, you can find information on this. It's very easy, but you do have to call and make an appointment. You can't just show up. Mm -hmm. That's important information to have. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that picture. Um, and another thing to kind of cover as we're thinking about kind of coronavirus in our community um, is just reopening because it's almost June and that is what everyone is talking about. Um, so things are looking a little bit different in Somerville. Um, on May 18th, the governor announced, um, well, he, uh, earlier he had announced the fact that there would be a phase reopening plan, but on the 18th, he shared the phase reopening plan, all four phases. Um, but pretty quickly, Somerville Mayor Joe Curtitoni responded saying, wait, we're not gonna follow that exactly. We're gonna have a tailored plan for Somerville. Um, so it, they, you know, they took a few days and then they did end up releasing a phased reopening plan for Somerville. Um, there are many similarities, um, but there are some notable differences. Um, so for example, um, the construction phase is kind of similar to the state. So certain um, municipal and utility projects are, are um, start, started up on May 18th, um, but there are stringent safety plans that have to be approved before these projects can begin. And this, um, this is the city compared to the state plan? Yes, correct. These, these uh, uh, um, uh, restrictions are in the city plan. The city plan, correct. Um, so a lot of, I think a lot of what the, the city plan did is kind of just spaced it out. So whereas the state plan um, had kind of a few more things kind of compressed onto May 18th, May 25th. They're kind of going by like um, Mondays or Tuesdays, kind of the beginning of the week to see kind of how to reopen things up. 
Um, and Somerville was like, you know what, we're just going to kind of take some more time with this. Um, and notably, one of the kind of biggest conversations in the business community is around the fact that in the state's phase one plan, um, barber shops and hair salons were allowed to reopen. But in Somerville's phased plan, that is not the case. So they were kind of put on hold. Um, and the, the city has held um, the city has held several, um, I think, like business town halls of sort mm -hmm. to um, figure out, like to talk with these business owners about what is the right thing to do and how they're going to move forward. Um, so, and the city has been engaging in numerous town halls or kind of to figure out like where business owners are at and how they think we should be proceeding. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a kind of distinct difference. Um, but there, there are, you know, there's a whole plan um, in Somerville, whereas the state kind of said, like, these are the four phases. We're going to take it three weeks at a time. If we need to extend phase one, we're going to extend phase one. Somerville said, look, here's our plan for phase one. We're going to reevaluate and see how we feel about phase two and the timing of it all. So they're not necessarily releasing a four phase plan all out immediately. Um, so we're going to kind of continue hearing updates from the city about how that's going to go. Um, I know the the just to stay on this topic a little bit the um, the governor's plan uh, was criticized uh, mm -hmm. because uh, it it didn't some groups uh, felt like uh, groups like the Massachusetts Coalition of Occupational Safety and Health mm -hmm. um, said that it did not provide Massachusetts workers uh, with little or no recourse to which they can report unsafe working conditions. Um, and it's been publicly criticized by Alana Presley and Mike Connolly. Um, so that's criticism of the the state reopening plan. Mm -hmm. um, so is is uh, Joe Curtitoni kind of not? Is he is his plan uh, different enough from the state plan um, to kind of mitigate some of that criticism? I think many of the local and federal leaders who have criticized the state plan have, um, well, I know um, some representatives have, have um, felt encouraged um, and definitely supportive of the city plan. Mm -hmm. um, where I've seen some just like disappointment is kind of um, in, in business owners who, you know, and, and specifically in, you know, salon owners who are happy that they're in a city that's being more cautious and taking some time, but they're also aware of the impact this can have on their business. You know, when hairdressers are open in Medford, Cambridge or whatever, um, or even further out because people are desperate for those <laughs> quarantine haircuts. Um, you know, we're all, we're all getting a little, a little shaggy, I guess. Um, but they're worried that they're going to lose clients you know, while, while other cities are reopening. But at the same time, they're also worried that there aren't many guidelines. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, I don't think anyone's really kind of angry or like blaming the mayor, like, Oh, you know, this is, this is stupid. This is bad. Um, but they, they you know, they're just not happy with the situation. Um, they, they wish this is not what we were dealing with, of course. Um, but right. from you what I keep seen, in mind that, that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, yeah. We're we're approaching as a nation a hundred thousand deaths. So you know there there is there is that you know the business end you have yeah you want to get back to business as normal but on the other on the other end of that is uh, you can't do normal right now. You just can't. Yeah. No, I know. Um, yeah. So I think you know in general people are struggling with this, but from what I've seen, you know I don't I don't claim to know every nook and cranny of kind of how this is playing out, um, but people have been impressed with and. Um, just excited about the level of city engagement that's happening. Uh, that the, at the very least, the city is asking them and, mm -hmm. and seeking their input you know, on how this should go. Great, thanks for that. Um, and moving on to uh, some nurse concerns from mm -hmm. Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so this is a definitely a nuanced issue, um, but last week. Um, last week, <laughs> I have to start saying dates. Um, <laughs> um, on May 20th, um, the, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Nurses Association or the MNA called a rare press conference um, on the lawn outside of CHA Cambridge Hospital, um, kind of near Harvard Square, um, about some concerns they have around working conditions and lack of access to personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, and this issue is definitely not isolated to CHA. Um, the way, you know, the way that I've kind of seen this in the news, if you kind of are just reading general Massachusetts news, not Somerville specific, 
Um, there are many you know, nurses who are struggling with this, which is part of why the MNA is getting involved. Um, they don't just represent CHA or Summerville Cambridge nurses, they represent Massachusetts nurses. Um, so this isn't just a CHA um, or Summerville Cambridge nurse issue. Um, but the general, the general feeling that I got from attending this press conference is that nurses are feeling that, um, first of all, as we've all been hearing, there is a massive shortage of PPE. Um, in nursing, that is face masks, but that's also gloves, face shields, um, you know, shoe booties, gowns, um, head coverings. There's, you know, a whole mess of PPE that goes into patient care. Um, so nurses are in general feeling that there is a huge shortage. Uh, they're having to reuse um, dirty items. And then beyond that, um, they're also forced to reuse masks that have been worn and decontaminated so they can be worn again. Mm -hmm. um, and one nurse, uh, Jillian Brelsford, um, at the press conference called this um, the biggest failure of occupational health and safety in the history of nursing. And the reason why I, I believe um, they kind of are referencing it as such, and the MNA is you know, supportive of this position, is that prior to this pandemic, it was, you, you know, you would be reprimanded. It was completely unacceptable to reuse an N95 mask, a face mask, any of this PPE. Um, it was not standard, completely unacceptable in the healthcare setting. Um, but given we're in a pandemic and there's a shortage and there are patients that need care, there have been several emergency orders, declarations, et cetera, from, from the FDA, from you know, other healthcare oversight organizations that say, you know, we, you can do this. You can decontaminate using UV, you can decontaminate using um, just other chemical systems so that you can reuse PPE and make the most out of what you have because there is this shortage, mm -hmm. um, which is on one hand, you're like, thank goodness we have a way of reusing masks, but the nurses who are wearing this PPE are saying, no, 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 like it's coming back soiled. The masks don't fit. Sometimes they come back stretched out. Um, sometimes they smell really bad. They make them feel faint. Mm -hmm. um, and the MNA has put out a press release about how um, essentially reminding nurses of their right to refuse decontaminated PPE. Um, so there's just kind of a lot, a lot of controversy over this. And it's a tough, it's a tough issue because, you know, there's a shortage and patients need care, but also, you know, why are we requiring our nurses to put themselves this much at risk when we never would have allowed them to even reuse the mask before? Right. And there is no research on whether these new decontamination methods are really proven or safe um, because we don't have long-term health measurements. So one um, MNA person I was talking to mentioned, you know, this may be an issue where in like 30 years, 50 years, there are going to be commercials for like personal injury attorneys, you know, wondering about like, you know, were you a nurse in 2020? Like you can seek damages. Like that's kind of how they're treating this. It's like, you know, yes, for the moment, they've been granted emergency um, orders allowing them to continue, but we don't know. We don't know the long-term health outcomes these could have on nurses and why are we asking them to do this for us? Mm. Um, so nurses are kind of starting to rally around that issue. Um, you know, I will say, you know, CHA put out a statement saying, you know, we are completely in compliance with federal and state guidelines. We are using approved methods. CHA uses the UV de decontamination method. Um, but even so nurses are just, they're not happy with the situation. Um, so it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough issue. Um, it's, it's definitely not simple. Um, but the one thing that stood out to me um, which is an issue not just with CHA, I would say it's an issue across the board, um, is an issue of transparency, um, which as a journalist, <laughs> I was very interested in. Yeah. Um, part of what the nurses are requesting um, is they're saying, okay, you're saying we have a shortage of PPE, so we have to work in these conditions. Fine, show us the numbers. Show us your supply chain. Tell us like how many you have in stock. Like what is, so that we can participate in the conversation about how this PPE is used. And, and are those numbers? They are not. So at the, at the moment, CHA has not released those numbers to them. They're, I guess they have made a request twice. CHA has not responded, or they have responded, um, but not, have not released those numbers. Um, and the nurses are just, they're saying that they can't really engage in a conversation around this until they have a window kind of into that. Um, but the reason why, 
I say this is not CHA specific is because in conversation with an MNA representative, um, he said that this is not isolated, that they have made requests of numerous hospitals across the state to make that very same information available so that they can participate in those conversations and no hospitals yet have done that. Um, so this definitely made me interested. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I don't necessarily know, I know I'm not a hospital executive, I'm not in management, I, I, I can't imagine what they're dealing with, this must be a really difficult. Um, but I think the nurses concerns is that, you know, first of all, they want to know if they're telling the truth, they said, how can we kind of verify your statement? Um, if we don't know the information that you are referencing. Um, but they also want to especially moving forward, kind of as we as we come out of the um, really urgent, um, kind of high, high, um, the peak, right, just the peak, the, the kind of peak moment of um, COVID cases in our hospitals, like, they want to ensure that hospitals don't continue to kind of use this PPE so that they can save money or like do do other things and put their nurses at risks at risk for the bottom line. And I'm not at all saying that's what CHA is doing. Um, nurses are asking for that information so they can so they can verify that. Mm. Um, and the CHA, you know, they put out a lot of statements about how they are taking care of, of, pay, of workers, um, how you know they are not requiring workers, um, they're you know paying anyone um, who is out sick um, full pay. You know, if you have COVID, you have full pay. Um, so they, you know, they've put they've put out a lot of statements about how they are caring for their employees at this time. Um, so, so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying CHA is the bad guy at all, <laughs> for sure. It's a complicated, um, complicated issue. It sounds yes. like. Yes, it really is. Um, so it's it's just something to keep an eye on because I think we're going to be seeing more of this across mm -hmm. the state, um, and it, it is something that you know I I found asking myself, like you know why why do I expect nurses to kind of Put themselves at risk like this for me um, is that is that really what they signed up for is that really what they have to do and it, and also keep in mind it's not just nurses you know there are other you know you know police stations and fire departments who are also having to decontaminate and wear a decontaminated PPE um, so it's just something a good thing to keep in mind kind of as we move forward um, yeah so it's it's a tough issue <laughs> but that's kind of where where we're at the moment and then moving on to uh the shared streets pilot program. Mm -hmm. um, the city announced this recently uh, that uh, a section of East Somerville will be closed off uh, in certain parts of the day. Um, is that correct? Uh, why don't you fill me in on the details? <laughs> sure. Um, so it's not certain parts of the day, it's just in general. Um, so yes, uh, on May 16th, I believe, the city announced the shared streets initiative. Um, which has definitely gotten a mixed response, um, but they're they're moving forward with it. Um, it is essentially a pilot program. So all of the kind of the ways that they're going to be editing these streets is temporary. There's not going to be construction or permanent things put in place. They're going to be using cones and signage and all that fun stuff to kind of alert street users to these changes. Um, but the goal is just to give residents more room mm. just more room to be outside and really the timing of this is you know certain it has to do with the fact that we're heading into summer it's very warm <laughs> um we're, you know we're starting to have some of those 80 degree days here in new england um and you know the city is aware that people are going to need to be outside and um, they want to ensure that people have the ability to go for walks and maintain social distancing um, so what this will mean is that low volume, mostly residential streets um, across the city um, are going to start having some of these temporary measures put in place um, to limit their use to residents and abutters, um, to cyclists, to people on foot, and to first responders and deliveries. So, you know, if, uh, if you're getting a delivery, that delivery truck, um, you know, mail, mail, of course, mail trucks can go down the street. If you're a resident, you are not going to be losing any parking. Um, you can go down your street and park as you normally would. Um, the goal of this is really to limit kind of cut through traffic um, in, in terms of kind of people using Somerville as a cut through and using some of those back streets um, to kind of avoid those main thoroughfares. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, they did release a map. Um, I'm not going to go through every single street <laughs> that's being shut down, um, but they are beginning in the East Somerville Winter Hill neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, 
kind of like around Tufts Street and then going through Somerville and kind of up um, up Winter Hill. But if you look at the map, um, they have kind of in, in more bold, they have like the streets that are going to be um, kind of implemented very soon in the first or second week of June. And then they have some of the other streets marked that are going to be implemented over the course of the month. Um, and the goal of this is to really like just try it out and like see how residents feel with it. Mm. When I was talking with Director of Mobility, Brad Rossin, he said that, you know, they're going to be setting up a line of feedback communication with cities so that residents can share their, their feedback and their critiques on how this is going. Um, what could be done better, and that this isn't this isn't necessarily going to turn into something long term. That's not necessarily what's going to happen on any of these streets, especially because you know when winter hits again, these cones aren't going to remain in place. Um, but, you know, there's going to need to be um, you know plowing and all of that that happens. So it's not necessarily true that this is going to turn into like a long term permanent thing. Um, but the city did say that you know they're interested to see how this goes, and it is you know it could be you know a little just a research opportunity or kind yeah. of where, where some of this might be possible in the city and how residents feel about it. Um, so. On my walks, you know, I'm walking down the sidewalk, I'll see a group coming, maybe I'll see a jogger coming at me, you know, and I'll want to, you know, if, if I can see, you know, it, it involves some mental calculation. I'm yeah. sure you've experienced this also where, um, you know, somebody's coming at you and you're trying to figure out who's going where, if it's not, if, if it's not obvious, if the sidewalk is too narrow, mm -hmm. Um, if there's not, you know, a, a place where anybody can can go pretty pretty quickly. So often, what I'll do is step out into the street itself. So um, if you're closing off the street, it it makes sense to to do that with with some exactly. Of the streets. Exactly. Yep, that's the goal. Great. Um, yeah. Sounds like a good program. Um, and then uh, farmers markets. We had some farmers markets uh, open back up recently. Um, under under very changed uh, conditions. Um, uh, why don't you fill us in about those? Yes. Um, so yes, the Union Square and Davis Square farmers markets have opened. The Union Square market is on Saturdays, uh, like nine to one, and the Davis Square market is on Wednesdays, like Wednesday afternoons. Um, so the cool thing is that they're open. <laughs> um, I, I definitely am a lover of local produce and flowers and all of that. Um, so that is really exciting. Um, but in general, um, I think, you know, I, I didn't cover this myself. I had a freelancer go out, um, but the pictures that she took were really telling in that, you know, the kind of old, um, farmer's market atmosphere of maybe there's a musician and there's local artisans and, um, it's more kind of like a party, <laughs> I guess, um, like a kind of a block party. Um, you know, that, that wonderful kind of neighborhood vibe isn't possible right now. Um, so you know, more more than anything, these markets are just a resource um, for the community for local locally sourced healthy food, um, and also they're they're not selling pre made like pre made food. So there used to be um, like vendors, you know, selling you know whether it be a rape or ice cream or like fun stuff like at these um, farmers markets, and those vendors are not there. So it's more like grocery items, um, flowers, things like that. Um, so. On the one hand, that's great. You know, some residents may have more access to like locally sourced fresh food in their neighborhoods. Um, so that's a that's a good thing. Um, you know, and you know, these the city and the the um, organizations themselves have worked hard to implement like hand washing stations and aisles so that there's kind of one way traffic through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, Unlike ever before, you have to kind of book a time slot. Um, so there's more kind of online engagement with farmers markets. You can't necessarily just walk over um, and kind of go on up and pick out your groceries. So it's definitely, it's a very, it's a very different environment than what we're used to kind of heading into spring. Um, but on the whole, I, I like to think it's still a good thing um, because it's bringing kind of good, good, healthy food into our neighborhoods. Um, and it's hopefully helping out some of these local farmers and local vendors um, who are having trouble right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Getting getting that food out there. Yeah, um, and have relied on these seasonal markets as as part of their income. Yes. Um, so it's it's good that they will have a version of that um, for this year. Exactly. Exactly. So it's tough. You're not going to get to dance in the street to that super fun folk band you like seeing at the farmers market. Um, I won't get to dance in the street. <laughs> <laughs> mostly it's myself. Um, but on the whole, I think, you know, I think it's a really good thing. And one, one thing to mention, um, about the union square farmers market is they, they do participate and 
um, accept SNAP benefits. Um, so they they have been working pretty hard to ensure that they um, that they are like participating in the kind of food assistance and food security like initiative to make sure that people have access to affordable groceries. Um, so that's something to look into. Um, the Union Square Main Streets oversees that farmers market. So if you head to their website, you can find um, more information. Yeah, yeah. I uh, spoke with uh, um, Julia. Uh, no, I'm speaking with Julia now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Jessica. I spoke with Jessica Eschleman yeah. of, uh, of uh, Union Square Main Streets, and she she brought up um, that. SNAP benefits uh, are available mm -hmm. and they've uh, been increased to some degree. So yes, definitely check out uh, the Union Square Main Street's website for details on that. Yes. Get out there and use your SNAP benefits for fresh. <laughs> um, we have uh, just a few minutes to touch on uh, some legislation, uh, proposed legislation um, regarding uh, food delivery apps. Do you want to- uh, I'll burn through it. You want to touch on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is something, um, this is not isolated to Somerville. There are cities all over the country who are starting to talk about third party delivery fees. So this is your Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, et cetera, um, who work with restaurants to, to deliver food. Um, so this is definitely um, kind of a controversial issue. Um, some people um, are really, really want to keep these around. Um, you know, it, they're definitely geared towards the person ordering food more than more than the restaurant. Um, and while they can support some restaurants who don't necessarily want to run their own takeout operation, what's happening now is restaurants who normally can open and have a bunch of diners in their restaurants, um, they do some delivery, but not a ton of delivery. And the, the dollars they make from having dine-in customers far outweigh and outset um, the dollars they have to pay to have these delivery services, that's not happening. Mm. Um, but now more than ever, restaurants are relying on delivery services. Um, so it's, you know, it's different across the board. Um, but when I talked to some local restaurant owners in the Union Square area, um, they reported like 20 to 30% commissions taken by the service, which is a pretty big chunk um, when you aren't doing much other business. Um, and they're they're really struggling and this is these are also businesses who never really did take out before so they're also navigating new services they're trying to reach a new kind of customer base um and ben you and campin um of ward three um city council ward three he introduced a resolution at the um, somerville city council to support some state legislation um bill 5054 um, which is an emergency bill essentially means that was introduced um, like with immediate relevance to the COVID pandemic. Um, so it's called an act relative to restaurant delivery commissions during the COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, and he has circulated a letter to, which has been signed by over 40 um, regional kind of counselors, state representatives, et cetera, um, to the governor and the speaker of the house asking them to immediately support and put through this bill. Um, which would limit the amount that third-party delivery apps and companies could charge customers in commission um, or charge restaurants in commission um, for their delivery services, mm. which they're saying, um, I think you know, many feel that this should be limited forever, but I think this bill is saying that at the very least during the emergency, these restaurants need support. So it needs to be limited at the moment while these restaurants are relying on delivery services. Um, All right. So, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. <laughs> We have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Julia, for joining me on another news roundup. Um, if And anybody uh, that's curious about learning more uh, on any of these stories, go to the Somerville Journal website, which is <laughs> somerville.wickedlocal.com. Nice. All right. Thanks again, Julia. Thank you so much.